Zen, right? There we go. All right, so welcome and namaste and welcome especially to our new guest and anybody joining us for the first time. And um, so here's where I am right now. I've been meeting with students, uh, you know, teaching online courses is uh, always a challenge, but I uh, welcome that challenge very much. And um, anytime you're, um, you know, meeting with students, um, it's eye-opening in a lot of different ways. First of all, it's eye-opening because I got a lot of fucking brilliant students this semester, and some of them are just awesome, and um, so happy to get to know them and meet them and have them in the course. And I've been listening to student podcasts um, for, uh, yeah, all week, and um, and they're really good. They're coming along. You know, it's the first one. First one's always a little rocky, sort of getting to know you kind of stuff, and um, but uh, uh, but it's they're all really cool people. Most of them, the vast majority of them, are nurses. Um, so that's typical. Uh, I've been teaching this course at Pittsburgh State for um, was like my twenty seventh time, I think, teaching this course at Pittsburgh State. And um, every time is different, and this time is very different. But um, but also kind of the same. And every time I always have lots of nursing students. So this time I think I have about. I don't know, 70% of the students in the course are, um, are nursing students, or most of them are currently working as, um, which is always insightful and, um, and heartwarming too, because I have nothing but the utmost respect for nurses and all of what you guys do, in part because just I could never do it because I don't like icky things or sick people. Um, and uh, so kudos to you guys. Um, but as I'm also meeting with people, you know, it just becomes, it, it becomes um, clear that some, some of my students are just sort of um, heading, um, they're sort of on the fast track to failure. And um, I don't like to see any of my students fail over the years. Um, I think every registrar at every university um, at least looks twice when they see my final grades every semester, because in a course of, um, in a class of 25 students, I'll usually have, um, you know, 20 A's um, and then two, maybe two D's and then three or four F's um, and sometimes more than that. Um, so I have kind of a higher fail rate than a lot of professors, um, but I also have a way higher, um, you know, rate of A's. And I will say, um, shout out to my Stonehill peeps, if any of them see this at some point. Um, yeah, I did have a class last fall. You know, I've always said that I wanted a class where everybody in the class got an A. And I had a class last fall where every single person, I had, I think, 26 people in the class, and every single one of them absolutely earned their A. Um, there was no doubt about any of them. Um, and so that I love to see. That's very encouraging and heartwarming for me. And it's nice to have, you know, not just A's, but, but you know, A's where I've got plenty of evidence that if anybody questions me, I'm like, yeah, they absolutely got an A. Have a look at all the things that they learned. And, um, you know, but it's hard to have to fail people and it's hard. Um, yeah, I, I've never had, of all the classes that I've had, um, you know, like I said, usually I have around 10 to 15% that fail. And I've never had any student um, complain about their failing grade. I've never had anybody say, you know, I really deserve to pass because most of them just didn't learn anything. And I don't, I don't do kind of assignments where like, oh, you get credit for doing it. That just seems like bullshit to me. Um, so this kind of information, there's different ways to consume information. One of the ways to consume information is just to kind of passively, you know, watch it while you're doing something else or, just, you know, there's lots of different ways. We're kind of bombarded constantly with media and information um, at all times. And much of it just kind of washes over us and that's normal and that's okay. But I don't want that to be the case for my classes. And I don't want that to be the case 
Um, in particular, because, you know, the, the things that we are learning, the content of these lessons, I feel, is um, if it's engaged in the right way, can and should be deeply transformative and deeply informative of, you know, it's, it, I think uh, most of the people in this call would agree that, the, um, that my courses help you to discover a lot about yourself. Um, and so it's a journey of self-discovery and getting some thumbs up. And uh, it's a journey of self-discovery. And that journey of self-discovery is always a, a journey of discovering yourself in connection or in relation to the world. So how do you fit into a context and what is your swadharma or your ikigai or your, um, you know, how do you fit in? In Christian terms, we might call it vocation. What is your calling or how do you fit in? And so um, that requires a certain amount of engagement. Um, in a particular way of engaging with the material. And that's, um, I think if students do that, it's always just so really clear um, that they are doing that. And for example, um, one of the ways that I know that my students are deeply engaging with the material and getting a lot out of it is because um, I begin to learn from them and I begin to learn from my students. And um, that's already be beginning to happen. You know, this is the third um, live class in this series. We've got a lot of online videos um, as well. And so they've been um, already now when I'm meeting with them individually or listening to their podcast, I'm learning a lot from my students who are engaging with the material and they have deep insights, right? About these profound things. For example, I had uh, a student I was talking to um, or I was listening to their podcast and they were talking about a lecture on um, the ontology, what well, was on ontology, zero and um, meaning of being or just what is being and that sort of thing. And um, in that, I had a section on uh, ontology of music and talked about Igor Stravinsky's um, Le, Sacré de Le Sacré de Printemps, the Rite of Spring, uh, which is a ballet and symphony. It's my favorite piece of music. Uh, and so I signed it, I, you know, I talked about it in the class and, and then I signed, um, you know, students to watch at least part of the London Symphony Orchestra performing this piece because it begins, um, it began, it was about the sacred, the, the, the rite of spring. So it's about a religious ritual, a pagan ritual, which is, um, you know, performed every spring. And in this ancient ritual, uh, it involved a virgin girl dancing herself to death um, as, as a sacrifice to nature. But it begins with this, oh, with this bassoon um, at a very high register, a register that the bassoon doesn't usually play on. Um, and it's this, it just begins, you know, the whole orchestra is silent, except for this bassoon kind of like eking out this, and Igor Stravinsky would describe that in the score as um, the moaning of the earth at dawn, so like as the at the beginning, at the creation of the universe and this, you know, moment of creation, which you all know is dear to my heart, right? I'm always talking about creation, creativity and recreation. So this moment of creation and this rite of spring, this waking up of the of the world of the earth um with just this small voice this moaning just like when you get up you know, kind of moan and you stretch and you get those kinks out um so that was kind of the part of the point of what i was talking about but she um she said you know it was, it was a long symphony and i wanted to watch it but i, I didn't really want to take all of the time to watch the whole thing so i watched it on double speed um, which I've never done. I've never watched a symphony on Del Speed before. Um, but now I want to, having listened to her talk about it, I'm like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to watch that on Double Speed. She's saying, you know, and, and watching the video, um, then you can see like the melody being passed back and forth from one of the orchestra to the other. And it's sort of this discourse, this dialogue that's going on and, and amongst the, the members of the orchestra. And we're talking about the energy of music. Like when does Stravinsky's Rite of Spring exist? Does it exist in Stravinsky's head when he first conceived of it? Does it exist when he wrote it down on paper? Does it exist, you know, or does it only exist in the performance? When symphony, that phone, the sim, 
sim meaning together and the phony meaning sound. So the, the symphony together performing this, bringing this music into being. And in the context of this lecture, I was talking about um, the Buddhist concept of uh, pratitya samutpada or mutual arising. Um, and uh, so it just fit perfectly. And it was a beautiful, beautiful example. Um, and it was one that I hadn't really thought about. So I think any time that students really engage the material, things like that come out, right? I mean, I listened to so many of your podcasts when, back in the day, and every single one of them I learned a great deal from and grew from. And so I think anybody who's meaningfully engaging this material, things like that are going to come out, things that are just uniquely yours, right? That just really come from, um, from you and from your engagement with the material. And that, to me, always is going to earn an A. So, and anything short of that is, well, failing to do that. Um, so that's why I don't really see any point in B, Cs, and Ds. They just seem like a waste of everybody's time. Um, so part, part of you, um, to start with that, um, see our cameraman was shift over here, but um, you know, online courses, online courses are difficult in part because the rate of failure in online courses is much higher than it is in just any course, um, in, in courses in general. Um, and uh, so um, think about how to overcome that. You know, in the classroom, one of the ways I overcome that is by, you know, having a moment in the semester where I just basically scare the shit out of everybody and kind of point out the fact that, yeah, a lot of my students fail and some of you are heading that way and some of them get the point and they course correct and they become awesome um, and uh, some don't. Um, but as a philosopher, you know, I'm also confronted with, um, you know, especially as an ethicist, what motivates people to do anything? And um, reading Plato's Phaedrus. So Plato's Phaedrus dialogue is one that I've talked about a lot in the, in the course lectures that the students are watching as part of this, um, as part of the pre-recorded lectures that, I'm, um, that are part of the course. And um, Plato's Phaedrus dialogue is, it's, it's my favorite text. It's one of my favorite texts by Plato. I just love Plato. Uh, but in that, he, he gives this allegory of a chariot. Let me check on my cameraman. Cyrus? Can you can you help out here? Um, he's getting food. Um, but uh, he gives this allegory of the chariot, and you can see me over there. But the allegory of the chariot. Um, so he uses the chariot allegory as a way to, um, um, as an allegory for the human soul, and he says it's. Plato's famous tripartite soul or three-part soul. The soul is, um, he likens to a chariot with the intellect as the charioteer um, who's controlling these two horses. One is the horse of rationality, reason, and makes good decisions. Well, not who makes decisions. The intellect is what makes decisions. Um, but the rationality at least can discern between this and that and tell the difference between this and that. Um, whereas that other horse, the horse of desire, which he calls eros, um, so that eroticism, that erotic desire from within, it's what compels us to do certain things, right? I mean, obviously there's, um, in English, that word erotism is closely linked with sex, um, but for, uh, and definitely for Socrates too, but um, because that sex drive is so very powerful, but also the, so the, the general desire to survive, uh, is very powerful. So that just that power, that desire to survive um, leads us to hunger, right? Which is a desire to eat, which is necessary for survival, and a desire for sex, which is the only way to overcome finitude, right? The only way to pro um, procreate or to continue the species is to have sex. That's how it works. And Socrates points out that you know. A lot of times, sometimes these two are in harmony. Sometimes you know what the right thing to do is and you want to do the right thing. I think in most every case, um, when you're talking about nurses, right? That's just what and hopefully nurses enjoy what they're doing in order to give care and to you know be a caregiver and 
help people and to um, those sort of things. And it's also rational and good and beneficial. So you can judge it to be beneficial. And it's also, if you are a nurse, hopefully you have a desire to do that. And so uh, Socrates points out, these things are in harmony. And when that's when that happens, that's a beautiful thing, right? So then you are you naturally do the right thing. You do what is good, uh, what is beneficial for society and for yourself because you have, have a rational um, impulse to do so, but also because you have the desire to do so. But he points out sometimes, often, uh, it's not the case, right? Often these two are at odds. So for me, I always give the example of pizza, right? I mean, I just love pizza and I'm happy that it's Thursday night because Thursday night here is pizza night. Most nights here are pizza night. But um, but pizza isn't something that's necessarily really good for you. You know, it'd be better if I ate broccoli or vegetables or fruit or something, right? Um, so I can, I know rationally which one is better for me and better to do, but I have that overwhelming desire for pizza and that usually wins out. But so then, um, so we have these desires for survival, food, sex, and pleasure. But then um, one thing we might notice is that we also have a desire to avoid certain things. And that comes in the form of fear, primarily fear of death, fear of finitude. And so that fear can also, or fear of failure. Um, so that fear can then cause us to, in Socrates' terms, reorient our desires. And in fact, this is, I think, one of the best definitions of uh, ethics, that ethics is the reorientation of desires. It's about taking this desire and instead of, um, so Socrates uses these very phallic symbols, right? So the, the desire for sex and pleasure kind of drives us down. But if we resist that, then, um, you know, much like a erect penis, then the, the desire towards the good can help us aspire towards those higher things. So for Socrates, the point of philosophy, the point of ethics, the point of theology, all, the point of everything I do is to try and cultivate a, a desire for what is good, or what he calls huperoranus, the that which is beyond heaven. And these are ultimate transcendent things, which we can't see, right? That's what makes them transcendent is that we can't see or have any um, visceral experience with them. Um, so then it's very hard to cultivate a desire for those transcendentals when we're confronted every moment with things that feel good, right? And so in Plato's Phaedrus dialogue, it's the discourse about, you know, the, the teacher wanting to have sex with his student, um, when instead trying to take that and see what the student, what the teacher really, what a good teacher really desires is that image of God within. Um, and so Socrates talks about, you know, there's lots of different gods. Uh, he's talking about, you know, operating within the mindset of the um, the Greek pantheon, so the 12 Olympiads. And so each one of these are very different, you know, Ares and uh, Apollo and uh, et cetera. And so a good teacher needs to be able to recognize that image of God within that student, right? Whether it's the image of Apollo or the image of Zeus or what have you. And then to see that image within the student and then to um, this, the teacher has that desire to bring that image into being, right? To bring it into fruition. And that desire is then um, for, as Socrates explains, then the student doesn't have that notion. They don't have a glimpse of that transcendent. They don't, they don't understand that, but they begin to see, and I love this passage in, um, in Phaedrus where he says, you know, you can see the student begins to see reflected in the eyes of the teacher. So when you're looking into the teacher's eyes, what you see reflected back is your own image, but it's not an image in a mirror. Instead, it's the image that the teacher sees within, right? That image of God, image of the divine um, that the teacher wants to bring out. And then that um, begins to reorient the student's desires towards the good. Um, and then this uh, just, you know, maybe thinking about the, the folks in this, um, in this uh, meet and, um, and whatnot. You know, in our, in our class at BC, we had a whole section on The Good Place, and um, we love The Good Place here. The kids and I watched The Good Place. We've watched it, um, we've watched it more than once all the way through. Um, and, you know, there's this, um, this 
I think it's season two, episode four. I could be wrong about that, but um, I was rewatching it the other day. And um, in that one, Michael, so Michael's a demon, and uh, but he wants to try and be better, right? So he's trying to convert. Chidi is the, the ethics professor, and he wants to try and uh, instill Michael a desire for the good, right? How can you in inculcate this desire in, in the good? And um, he realizes the reason he's having so much trouble doing that is because Michael is immortal. And because he's immortal, he has no fear of death. And then so he has this breakthrough moment where he gets Michael to understand the, the potentiality for death. And as soon as Michael realizes the possibility that he may not exist anymore, or that he may die, then that fear of death causes a existential crisis, right? And he begins crying and sobbing. I had some pictures I'm going to show, of, you know, Ted Danza crying in Chidi's lap and Chidi with this big, awesome, you know, huge smile on his face where he's so excited because he's caused this existential crisis within his students, right? And his student is, you know, just confronting not only the, the reality of death or the potentiality of death, but also the, the possibility of leading a life that's utterly pointless. And I think for me, um, you know, we began this this series, or at least a series of live lectures, the with that first one, the the pastor that was the first um, attempt at live streaming. Um, but in that, you know, we talked about the Buddha's experience, and the Buddha also had that experience where he was confronted not just with the reality of death, but also the possibility of just leading a meaningless, pointless life. And so that existential crisis can come in a number of forms. One is the, you know, um, recognizing the reality of death or in a course like this, the, um, the possibility of failure, but also just the point, the possibility of, of just wasting one's time, right? Of leading a life that is pointless or um, to translate it into terms of this course, right? To go through a course to get nothing out of it, right? Or you go through and you just memorize facts or you get information and it kind of, yeah, you memorize it for a test or something like that. And then it doesn't have any real effect on you or the people around you and you forget it because why would you remember something that's pointless? So um, for me, you know, if that were what I was doing with my life, then I would just go back to finance because at least then I'd have a lot of money um, and some sort of job security and health insurance and things like that. Um, but for me, I want instead to make my time existentially meaningful. And in order to do that, I have to get my students to have some sort of existential crisis moment of growth. And that's difficult in an online course. Um, but I think in some small way, it begins by recognizing the potential for failure. Um, and so that's where we are right now. And this, you know, as I was thinking through this the other day, um, kind of following this train of thought because i also wanted to talk about evolution of saying that we want to talk about evolution um in a bunch of the previous um lectures and we'll talk about it more um in fact next week i want to talk about um sri arabindo and double evolution i'll get to that in a minute but um evolution so let's think about this this word evolution um i actually plan to bring the the dictionary um, Oxford English Dictionary in the other room. I was going to read you a little passage from the definition of evolution. Um, but the word evolution comes um, um, to evolve. Um, the opposite of it is uh, the, word, the word envelope, right? So if you think about an envelope, an envelope envelops something. It folds in. And so an envelope is, you know, sort of folded in in order to contain something, right? So when you envelop something, you're, you're folding things in. And evolution is the opposite of that. It's the unfolding. Um, so we talked about this last week. Lindsay brought up this, you know, one of the ways of understanding um, evolution is this unfolding explicatio. Um, and so that's gonna bring us to Kusa in a minute. But um, so evolution really means unfolding. And this um, amazing, amazing theologian, one of my favorite theologians, um, certainly one of my favorite living theologians, this 
Rosemary Radford Ruther, and she wrote this text, Gaia and God, which we read as part of the religious quest at Boston College, and um, and would be reading as part of this course, but it's such a compressed six-week course, it's hard to engage things at a deep level um, when reading. But I want to try and get some of what she's saying in here. And in, in her second chapter of this text, I talked a bit about the first chapter last week. We were talking about uh, Genesis, and, um, and she talks about these various um, creation stories, and particularly uh, understanding the context of Genesis 1 within its historical context, within the Babylonian oppression of the Jews by uh, the Babylonians, um, and how they use the stories, the creation story, Enuma Elish, in order to emphasize um, or justify, really, justify slavery and oppression. Um, whereas, as Radford Ruther points out, when you read Genesis 1 in that context, particularly Genesis 1, 26, 27, that humans are made in the image and likeness of God, not in the image and likeness of slaves, right? Then that can be liberating and freeing and opening. But then she points out in the second um, chapter that we really need to rethink, now this is 40 years old now at this, at this point, her texts have been enormously influential, um, not just on me, but on many. But she says, you know, too often, the way that we teach evolution in, in schools and the way that many people have learned and understand it and the way it's used in popular discourse, we, we, we conflate evolution and natural selection. And we think about evolution in terms of natural selection and evolution in terms of red and tooth and claw and that sort of survival of the fittest, uh, which fittest usually means to take the, right, the, the cheetah, not the gazelle. Um, and, uh, but instead, evolution really is an unfolding, even as Darwin understood it, right? This is why he used this word, um, as I drew last week, it's sort of an unfolding of one species becoming more than one species, one species becoming multiple species. So to understand speciation as an unfolding of one species into many, right? A flourishing, a developing. And um, I have a, another, um, another friend, another graduate of Boston College, um, who's a medical student. And we talk about this a lot in terms of um, neuro, what do you call it, Neur uh, neurology or neurobiology, um, and how the brain forms various pathways. And one of the ways, um, you know, we talked about neuroplasticity and that sort of thing. One of the, the brain forms various pathways. And as it does so, there's a sort of experimentation phase that goes through it. And we see this, I see this in my kids and I see this in other kids, right? There's an exploration and experimentation, the sort of you, you gain knowledge through experience and experimentation, which is sort of a um, experiment, exper kind of going around and going out. So X meaning out and peri meaning around. So something that grows, you grow through that going around and going out and sort of experimenting, right? Trying new things and getting outside of your um, traditional pathways. And that actually builds, um, you know, the synapses draw connections and they build connections. And that's what enables us to think at higher and higher levels. But uh, as we do so, the flip side of it is that we can get ingrained in those sort of patterns of thought, right? And that becomes difficult to get outside of those patterns of thought. So we need some you know, ways to force ourselves to think otherwise or to think about other possibilities, which may have been just as good, right, in different contexts and different learning environment than those other pathways, right? Um, likewise in evolution, when I was um, first drawing, when I was first kind of conceiving of this course, um, those of you who follow me on Snapchat know, you know, I was like posting at the light board and all this sort of I'm not an artist. I'm terrible at art. I try. I, try. I have that. Feel. I have that desire to be an artist, and so I'm trying to get these ideas. I'm a very visual thinker, and trying to get these ideas into visual form, and always centered around a tree. Um, and there's just so many trees. In I mean, trees are ubiquitous, right? All humans have experience with trees, so it's not surprising at all. I think that many human that you know, pretty much every human society has some sort of myth about trees or trees feature prominently within myth. 
certainly we talked about the the parallelism in Genesis one between the seed and the tree and the forest, uh, and then the the human and the um, human individual, and then the community or society, and all that's in Genesis one, and then of course in Genesis two trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, we also have um, um, something that we probably won't really get into this. I don't know if we'll get into, hopefully we'll, we'll at some point in this course, going to be over so soon. Um, this is lecture three of six, so we're halfway through. Um, but uh, in Bhagavad Gita chapter 15, which always ends my religious quest course, um, that uh, there's a description of an upside down tree, a tree with its roots in transcendence, with its roots in truth, its roots in which is kind of coming down and reaching its branches down into this world, into the imminent world. And so that goodness, truth, um, beauty, all those sort of things, reaching them down into the world, if only we will, you know, uh, receive those. And as I was trying to draw that, um, which again, I'm going to draw, but as I was trying to draw, it was like, since I've never taken any kind of drawing course ever, um, I was just, you know, I would draw it and it like, it just didn't really look like a tree. And I was trying to get the roots, right? The roots and the branches. And how do you draw roots that look like roots? And then I realized, all right, well, let me think. This is going to sound weird, but it's me. I'm weird. Um, let me try and think like a root, right? And the way that a root grows is it just kind of like, you know, you've got the, you've got, I don't know, the stalk, and then the root just kind of goes down, and it's like experimenting, right? And it just finds a pathway, and then, you know, something else kind of branches off, and then you've got another root over here, and it may come this way and say, oh, there's a root there. And so the way to draw roots is just to kind of think about, you know, how they grow, and they grow through experimentation, and some things work, and some things don't. And so the ones that work kind of flourish and grow bigger, and the ones that don't, you know, don't. Um, so uh, likewise, when we think about genetics, um, genetic, um, the way genetics work, right, is through a process of experimentation. You have two different genetic codes coming together, and they create new possibilities. And some of those possibilities work well, and some of them don't work as well. Um, and so we think about that in terms of natural selection, but as uh, Radford Ruther points out, Natural selection doesn't occur based on who's fastest or who's strongest. It occurs by who is best in harmony with their environment, right? So those that find a niche that they can fill unlike that others around them can't fill or that they can fill more adequately or better than those around them, that's what enables them to survive and flourish, right? So natural selection isn't so much about the selection as it is about finding one's niche. And as I was reading that and thinking of that, um, it, um, yeah, it brought me back to my understanding of Hindu theology and Swadharma, right? That to find, um, we will in a couple of weeks get into the Kata Upanishads. And um, so the Kata Upanishad distinguishes between and preya, that which is good for oneself, um, which brings happiness and goodness for oneself, and that which is shreya, that is just good for society, good for everyone around us. And when you and sometimes those two things can be at odds in the same way that the horse of desire and the horse of rationality can be in intention or at odds with one another. And sometimes they're in harmony. And when you find that harmony where um, Shreya and Preya coincide where your what makes you flourish and you know makes you feel self-actualized also meets the world's needs and those around you and enables those around you to flourish and grow, then that's your Swadharma. And then that together we can manifest Dharma. Um, okay, so um, before I'm gonna I'm gonna shift. I'm going to shift gears a bit, but let me just stop um, and pause and um, yeah, get some, get your insights. What are you, what are your reactions to any of that or anything you want to add to that um, or tell me I'm full of shit? Um, the roots thing is really cool um, because 
I feel like you see that in life. Um, what you were saying about how when uh, roots just kind of like naturally take their course and they might like some that don't work out, they stop and others continue to grow. That actually reminds me a lot of neuroplasticity um, because that is like your brain. Well, that is like your whole experience kind of like, go, sorry, I have my hair. <laughs> no, that's, great. Um, uh, that's your whole experience in life, you know, like going one way and then um, maybe you like a certain activity and then you, um, by doing that, you learn about a different thing and it all takes like being in the right place at the right time for those roots to form which i guess in an analogy way could be like the water and stuff like that yeah i mean the environment matters right so i mean i can be a seed right that's ready to grow and eager to grow but if i don't have the right conditions um in to enable myself to flourish then then yeah then that's i think it's not just that that seed dies, but also I think maybe the world is, um, you know, it's not enriched, right? I mean, so we're missing out on the beauty of that. Um, like I have a this meeting with, um, you know, I'm teaching two courses. One is this one and another one is, um, is the capstone thesis course. And somebody's writing their thesis on immigration and you know just really troubled by by so many people that are trapped in that town that are that are you know not allowed to flourish because of their conditions right so, so yeah that's you know put it back in theological terms right each one of us is this um irreducibly unique and particular image of god and to create conditions that prevent those from flourishing yeah seems um at odds with that in uh, Imago Day. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and if you actually don't flourish the way you're supposed to, that could definitely affect others as well. Yeah, exactly. At, um, in a future, uh, we're going to give a, uh, another lecture on, or a, a TED talk actually, by, um, by a botanist who studies trees and forests and you know that point out these forests are made up of diverse species of trees and it was thought in the past that these trees compete with one another for resources but her research shows that underneath the ground the network of roots is so deeply intertwined um, that they don't actually compete for resources but they share resources with one another and so that sharing of resources with one another you know even across species enables all of them to flourish and all of them to benefit because some are better at carbon fixing some are better at nitrogen fixing some are better at you know photosynthesis and some are better at you know these other things so by um by finding what each one is good at and sort of sharing those resources enables each one of them to to flourish um in this harmonious way so this also is right part of evolution finding this niche and natural selection through sharing i don't know how else to say it right but yeah that sharing together that growing together yeah I might have uh, misunderstood the point, but kind of going off this conversation, when you said, um, talking about the environment and, ha and harmony, you mentioned uh, natural selection and then genetics, or that natural selection doesn't have much to do with genetics, or it does, because I, I did my bachelor's in psychology and I was not a fan of how scientifically backed the genetics, um, the evidence for that was, you know, because it really showed that you know, you kind of are a product of your parents and, you know, um, all that stuff. So I was curious, um, are you saying that the environment you grew up in, regardless of your genetics, could make a huge impact on how you turn out? Um, I just, if you could clarify that on harmony and the environment and then genetics and natural selection. <laughs> oh, well, I certainly didn't mean to say regardless of genetics, right? Genetics is a big part of who we are, um, for sure. Um, but th those genetic predispositions, you know, enable us to flourish in some environments and not flourish in other environments. And so I think it's both nature and nurture, right? It's both the genetics and the, um, and the conditions. But thinking of psychology, too, um, you know, another variation on this theme to tap over and uh, continue the fugue a step further. Um, you know, if, uh, 
there's another professor at Fitchburg State who's a um, neuropsychologist. And um, we've just had so many amazing in, um, conversations with one another, not just about philosophy, but also about neurodiversity. And that, you know, we think we tend to label in our society different psychological um, abnormalities as abnormalities, right? Or as deficiencies. Like, I, um, I have quite significant attention um attention deficit disorder right which i no longer see as a disorder i i have attention deficit but in, in, i think it actually um enhances me to communicate with students in a classroom to be able to jump from topic to topic and to be able to focus intently on this and then jump to this and then jump to that. Of course, it can sometimes lead to disconnected or, you know, incoherent speech, but, but often I find that it actually enhances that ability. So I don't see it as a disorder. And likewise, so many other disorders, right, that instead of seeing psychological difference as an abnormality. Maybe you can come to see psychological difference as diversity, right? And that neurodiversity is something that enhances um, our our common growth, right? Um, I don't know, does that connect with what you were saying or does that clarify? I yeah, didn't I mean think, no, no, uh, you definitely clarified it. I think I had confused what you said earlier on in terms of the, the genetics, so that helps, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So can I say something about the neuroplasticity? So, so it's actually a pretty contested theory in neuroscience. This is my shit. I love this stuff. Um, so they, it's always in conflict with localization theory, which is like, you've only got one part of your brain that does one thing. The back of your head is just for vision. Like, no other part of the brain can do that. But neuroplasticity theory is, no, you can train a different part of your brain to do that instead. And it reminds me of, like, the like Irenaeus and like the malleability and it's like no like expansion through experimentation is like is a sort as a is a sort of survival technique it's mm. oh you've damaged this part well you can train a different part to now do that function and that you can you can train the brain to overcome certain things and it's like and only through like that constant adaptation that constant improvement um and and expansion like do you sort of can you continue to unfold and like if you keep if you like sort of dip if you mold yourself in that one spot and like just localization theory then you never like it's what are they what do you call it like what is it called i think it's kusa that says that like once you like cast that mold and you're stuck like that which is like what sh mm -hmm. like death should only do but it's like no while you're living don't let don't let yourself be cast like that continue to like yeah. expand it's irenaeus yeah irenaeus i mean Kudos to you, Irene. I mean, bringing in Irenaeus from, which was from Catherine Tanner's text, which is from what two years ago or whatever. And uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's just so impressive, um, as you always are. But yeah, so Irenaeus it uses, um, yeah, describes this relationship that we have with with God in terms of you know making oneself malleable like wet clay like you know clay that's not yet dried right and so we need to make to make ourselves open and malleable so that we can be shaped by the world and shaped into that niche right and so shaped into what the world and around us needs but also in a way that is in conformity with the individual what makes us unique and um, yeah he says you know if we if we allow ourselves to remain malleable and open to being open to change and open to new ideas and open to the spirit um then then you know when somebody uh i can't remember exactly how he said it he said it way more articulately but that um you know you can others then can see the fingerprints of god on you right because god is the one shaping you and that leaving those fingerprints um those impressions on you and um yeah, and then so death, then is sort of yeah, it's the drying out, right? It's the it's the solidification. It's the it's the time when the the mold is cast at that point, right? And so if you know, I rigid um, prior to death, then it's sort of like an early death, right? You've you've become who you are prior to your death, but 
life is a process of becoming, right? So we are constantly in flux or constantly in a state of change. And if we rigidify our thinking or our thoughts, then, um, then yeah, um, then that, that's akin to a, a cognitive or intellectual death. You know, that reminds me, um, this is a little bit of, that's not really a tangent, but just when other go, now when it gets, but um, is, uh, you know, thinking about, well, uh, thinking about incest, right? Thinking about why incest is bad on a, let's just leave it at a scientific level, right? So on a scientific level, um, incest, is bad because it's a re reduction of the gene pool, right? And so you need that diversification, that that flowing of new genetic material into the gene pool. Uh, and if you don't get that, then you get genetic abnormal abnormalities and genetic problems and things. So that's why inbreeding is, you know, generally looked upon as a as a bad thing um, at a genetic level. And as a philosopher uh, who thinks a lot about evolution on a lot of different levels, not just scientific, but also intellectual. I think there's something, when we look around our society and we look around our world right now, maybe what we have is a, a, what I might call a sort of ideological inbreeding, right? Where people get so um, caught in their own communities and their own ways of thinking within different circles, then they don't have that influx of ideas that challenge oneself or enable us to grow and flourish, to unfold those possibilities, those intellectual, cognitive, spiritual, emotional um, possibilities in various ways. And so I've started thinking about um, genetic inbreeding as sort of akin to ideological inbreeding, that we need diversification and we need that sort of influx of new ideas in the same way that we need an influx of new genetic material. Uh, I don't know if that, you know, it at least works as a metaphor, if not more than a metaphor. Um, okay, cool. So um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, there's this kid, uh, Raimundo Panikar. Um, he passed away, I think like 10 years ago um, at the age of 102. Um, he's, uh, he considered himself, um, he was a um, Catholic um, priest a dog wants out um and uh but he also he he said um he described his journey so he was born in um spain um in uh Cat catalan um and so he was born in spain his mother was spanish but his father was indian um and his father fled india um as part of the um well he was a Exile. So he fled India because he was um, he was a proponent of Indian um, Indian liberation, Indian freedom uh, when the in, when India was still uh, um, occupied by the British. And so he was fighting for British independence for sorry Indian independence from the British and um, and had to to leave. So he went to um, Spain and that's where he met Panikar's mom. And anyway, so then when Panikar was an adult, he became a Catholic priest. Um, and uh, then um, and, and wanted to go and visit his homeland to visit India. And so he describes that physical journey, that religious quest um, from Spain to India. Uh, and he, he describes it this way. He said, um, I, I left, meaning I left Spain. I left a Christian, found myself to be a Hindu and returned a Buddhist without ever having being a Christian. Um, and so even when his, um, in his little um, ashram in Catalonia, uh, you know, later in his life, he would, um, people would go to his ashram for spiritual, you know, journey and, and enlightenment and study. And um, Panikar, I guess, had this practice. He would say some, some days they would worship in a Christian style, and some days they would worship in a Buddhist style, and sometimes they would worship in a Hindu style. And it just depended on how he woke up that morning. <laughs> there was no sort of pattern or rhyme or reason to it. It's just sort of led by the spirit. But Panikar, excuse me, Panikar is um, absolutely one of the most brilliant philosophers 
He has a PhD in philosophy, a PhD in theology, and a PhD in chemistry. Um, and so just a radical um, just a, a remarkable thinker. He wrote, I think, fifty books, a lot of books. Um, and uh, so one of one of the his influence on me. There are many, but one is he has this whole discourse on the infinite, and so we're shifting now. The discourse on this um, might even use the God word uh, here and there. But um, describe. He said, you know, the infinite is in the finite, right? That if something is infinite, then it is without bounds. So it can't exclude me, right? That I am finite and yet I am the infinite. I can't not be, right? Because if I am not the infinite, then the infinite is no longer infinite, right? And the way I describe that in my classes is, um, you know, the, if, if if the universe is infinite or if God is infinite, then it has to include Lindsay. It has to include Brad. It has to include Irene. It has to include Forrest. It has to include Rachel, right? If it doesn't, then it's no longer infinite, right? There would be an Irene-sized hole in infinity, right? So to think about the infinite is in the finite then changes not only how we think about the infinite, but also how we think about the finite, right? Then to begin to see not only each individual human person as a unique, irreducible, uh, irreducibly particular image of God, but also each being, right? Not just human beings, but non-human beings and even physical things, non-organic things. Um, and part of this idea from Panikar comes from Nicholas of Cusa. Now, Nicholas of Cusa is so dope that I can't even begin to describe, describe his dopeness. He is, in my view, in my opinion, I guess you could say, the greatest thinker ever. Maybe, maybe Plato gives him a run for his money, but uh, but but Cusa is just, he's so incredibly Brilliant. And I always get, kind of get tongue tied when I start talking about him because I want to just sing his praises. Um, but one of Kusa's insights, very related to this, because I think Panikar is kind of getting out of Kusa. He was a big reader of Kusa as well. Um, Kusa lived, he was born in 1401 in Kuz, Germany, um, and died in 1464. Uh, um, so 15th century. Um, Christian philosopher, theologian, and, um, and, and mathematician. He wrote 15 books on math, mostly about the quadrature of the circle, the relationship between squares and circles. Um, and he, you know, pointed out that the most particular is the most universal. In other words, I only have an experience of reality through my particular experience, right? I don't, I want to know what it's like to be Irene. I want to know what it's like to be Marine, but I can't, right? I can, I only experience the world from my fixed positionality, right? That is my irregularity. And this is, of course, is the case for everybody, right? So the most universal experience is always going to be the most particular. And this insight, I think, largely shapes how I teach this class and how I teach uh, all of my classes. It's, I never talk about things like Buddhism or Christianity or Islam or this kind of made up categories, things that don't actually exist, but instead talk about Christians and Hindus and Muslims and Buddhists, right? Because Buddhists are real. Buddhism is not. Christians are real. Christianity is not, right? So if we want to understand Christianity, then we have to look at Christians. And the most particular is always going to be the most universal. So why not zoom in and hyper-focus on one individual and understand their theology, their perspective, their insights, um, not because it is uh, universally applied then to everybody, but precisely because it's not applied to everybody, right? If you want to really understand what it means to be Christian, then why not look at a Christian and understand that person's perspective? Somebody who... Shifting a little bit. So Kusa in this text, um, De Docta Ignorantia, which is Latin for unlearned ignorance, learning one's ignorance, realizing the limitations of one's knowledge and the finitude. How he talks a lot about epistemology, which is my 
um, my specialty and focus on how we know, what's the nature of knowledge, how do we learn? And he points out at the very beginning of this text, I was rereading it earlier today, um, that we learn through comparative relation. Um, and he's using that word. In Latin, um, in Latin, the word for mind, Uh, and Latin, and the word is ratio, um, which in English looks like the word ratio, because it is the word ratio, right? We learn ras rationality is a process of distinguishing between this and that. And um, Lindsay and other people in this class, um, you know, have probably learned way more than you wanted to know about that in my most recent lectures, talking about, you know, zero and Brahmagupta and the distinction, how signifiers divide reality into this and that, or um, in Aristotle's terms, you know, um, yeah, uh, rules of identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle. So um, signifiers, ideas, concepts, they divide reality into two different things, like red and not red, white and not white, chalk and not chalk. Um, so just knowing that helps us to understand the nature of reality. But he points out that knowledge, right? Knowledge is always going to come in the form of rationality, which is always learned through comparative relation. We learn by comparing one thing to another. We take what we, what we that with which we are familiar and then learn that um, which we are not familiar. Let me, um, Oh, um, okay, yeah, here he says, chapter three, it is self-evident, he says that a lot, that there is no comparative relation of the infinite to the finite. That's not what I was gonna read. Um, okay. Um, no, you know what, I'm not gonna try and read Krista. Um, so, but he says that, you know, we learn through comparative relation. We learn, we start with something that we know that's familiar, and then we see something that we don't know, and like, what the hell is that? And then how can we possibly learn or know what this unknown thing is, except by comparing it or holding it in relation to things that we know, right? So we say, okay, well, this is like this other thing, but it's also different, right? So I could have like two pieces of chalk. I'm like, okay, well, they're, they're really quite similar, but they're also quite different. So to understand the uniqueness of each one in comparative relation to, to, um, to other things, um, so all of that is knowledge, right? We learn through rationality, through comparing, through noting the differences between this and that, or one thing and another signifier and that which it signifies. Um, but the proportionality between knowledge and truth, which is what we really want to know, right? The truth, which is transcendent, the truth, which is the good um, or whatnot. So in order to know truth, um, he points out that the relationship between knowledge and truth he gives a syllogism. Uh, what is it? An app. There, this is to that, is this, that is to this, whatever you do. It on yeah, is that syllogism? Syllogism? Okay. So knowledge is to truth as a polygon is to a circle, right? So he points out that if you have a circle, uh, this is terrible. I shouldn't even try to draw. But um, if you have a square inside of a circle, if you want to turn that square into a circle, kind of getting into that Archimedean, the Archimedes postulate that I talked about in one of the lectures, um, the pre-recorded lectures, how can you get from a square to a circle? Well, one of the ways would be to square the number of sides, right? As you increase the number of sides um, of the polygon, then you if you think about the gap between the circle and the, the lines as being your margin of error, right? You reduce your margin of error by, by increasing the number of sides and number of angles. But even if you do that, you know, um, a thousand times, even if you square the sides of a square a thousand times, it's a polygon, right? It still has, it still is linear. It still is not going to ever resolve to a circle. Um, so we get closer and closer to the circle. Well, I get more and more perspectives, but we can never finally get to that. And Kusa uses this in another talk. I'm going to come back to Kusa next week. We'll talk about um, one of his um, most famous texts, De Visione Dei, and then we'll go from that into Aurobindo. But um, um, 
you know, he says, well, if we want to understand the truth of something like God, then we need, you know, the more perspectives we have on that, then the better. And even if we have all different, all perspectives, we're still not going to know the thing because having more knowledge brings us maybe closer to the truth, but we can never grasp the truth because truth is beyond our grasp. Truth is beyond knowledge. And so knowledge is to truth in the same way that a polygon is to a circle. So by having more knowledge, we come closer to the truth. By having more sides, the polygon comes closer to a circle, but never finally resolves into being that. Of course, because a circle is transcendent in the same way that truth is transcendent. Um, now, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get through. I think everything I'm planning to get through. Um, miracles never cease to amaze. Uh, okay, so there was this kid, Anselm, Saint Anselm. He lived in the 12th, uh, 11th century, and um, great theologian um, and uh, thinker about God. And he had a definition, I guess, uh, in his proslogion, trying to, you know, th what is theology and what is what is God? How would you think about, how could we come up with a definition of God? And his definition of God um, is this. I don't know if you can see it in the camera, but that than which nothing greater can be conceived. That than which nothing greater can be conceived. So whatever you can conceive, God is beyond that, right? So if you can conceive it, this is kind of building on um, an insight by another theologian, um, St. Augustine, who said, um, if you have understood, then what you have understood is not God. So yeah. Our understanding, God is always beyond conception. But I love that word conception. I think, think about that word conception a lot. To conceive, right? We use the word concept, like we have concepts in our mind which are conceived by humans. That's what makes them concepts, right? But the word conceive also has a Pro, um, a procreative sense, right? To conceive a child is to, you know, um, man and woman who love each other very much and are united in sacred matrimony by a Catholic priest, you know, then conceive a child. And that child um, is something that, you know, comes out of that union. Likewise, through our discourse with one another, we have conceptions of God, but um, God is always going to be that beyond our conception, that than which nothing greater can be conceived. Kusa came along, and um, Anselm was a pretty big deal, right? I think he's probably a saint by that time already. And um, Kusa was like, yeah, okay. Well, I'm not going to disagree with um, Anselm, um, but <laughs> um, but there's, there's a little bit of a problem here. Kusa is, um, Kusa, I think, uh, what makes him in, in my view, um, you know, one of the greatest theologians is that um, he's such a profound thinker about infinity and what does it mean? What is the infinite, right? What does it mean to be non-finite? And uh, he thinks, all right, so what if we, can we even try to wrap our heads around infinity? What would it mean to think of infinity, right? And uh, so Kusa says, well, we could think about all actuality, right? Let's think about the universe. The universe is infinite. And who uh, says this another great line also from this text where he says, you know, the universe is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere, right? There is no edge to the, to the infinite universe because it, if there was an edge to it, it wouldn't be infinite, right? So the universe has no, in, has no boundaries, has no end. And so then what, what is what, what is there, right? How can you define, like if we were to say, what is the center of a circle? Center of a circle is that which is, right? The circle itself is an infinite series of dimensionless points equidistant, the same distance from a single point, right? So whatever is at the center is equidistant from everything on the circumference. So if the universe is infinite, then by definition, I, Brad, right now, I'm at this. I'm not the center of the screen, but I'm at the center of the universe, right? Um, because the universe extends infinitely that way, and infinitely that way, and infinitely in every direction, right? So I am at the center of the universe, but 
even though Lindsay isn't here, she's also at the center of the universe. And, Mar and um, Maureen is at the center and Irene is at the center, right? So that's why Akusa says the universe is like an infinite sphere whose circumference is nowhere, but whose center is everywhere. But that still is not really infinite, right? And uh, Kusa points out that even being, we have being and non-being, right? So wouldn't the infinite include not only everything that is, but also everything that is not, right? So to be truly infinite would include, so how do we even think about what is not? Well, one of the ways we can think about is not in sort of concrete ways is in terms of possibility and actuality, right? So. <clears throat> at, if we think about the universe is an infinite, and I'm going to suddenly, I'm going to try and not talk about Rick and Morty. Um, but if we think about the universe as, um, you know, being an infinite, infinitely existing finite things, right? Or concrete material, matter and energy. Um, so actual matter, the universe, uh, material universe. Um, even that, then what do we think about possibility, right? Possibilities, how do we think about the ontology of possibility or the existence of possibility? So things can exist actually. Everything that exists actually, this chalk actually exists, right? But this chalk, this chalk actually exists and it also exists possible. It's possible for it to exist, right? It's, a, it's kind of a dumb thing to say. Like, of course it's possible for this thing to exist because it actually exists, right? Everything that actually exists also exists as a possibility. If it weren't, if it weren't possible, then it couldn't actually exist. But it's possible that this, this chalk could have been, you know, maybe at the factory they could have um, colored these um, atoms that make up this piece of chalk you know, orange, right? So it's possible for the for these atoms to have been orange, but they're not, right? Or we could make them orange. So just the fact that they could become orange represents a possibility of this actually existing, not as white, but as orange. So therefore the universe of possible things is always going to be infinitely larger than the universe of actual things. So uh, this leads Kusu to think about Anselm's doctrine that that which is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. He says, well, if we think about the universe of actually existing things, then I can still conceive of something bigger than that, which be the universe of possible things, right? So then he begins to think in his, um, in his later works, especially he begins to describe God simply as, um, as possibility itself, right? Possibility itself would include the universe of all possible things would include everything that actually exists, because everything that actually exists is possible to exist, but it would also include everything that is, uh, that exists as a possibility, but is not actual, actualized. But he says, all right, so maybe I'm being too hard on Anselm. Of course, he never criticizes Anselm, very um, politically deft in his writing. But, um, but then what if we were to think about a possibility, right? A possibility that exists in its most perfect and its most um, ideal way, right? So then we can also think about an actually finite existing thing, which exists in a way that's perfect, right? As perfect as it can be, um, given its its limitations or whatever. And spoiler um, alert: He's a Christian theologian, so his answer is Jesus. You know what? Let me read. Oh, he says this. This. Um, no, I can't. I've got two minutes. Um, but then uh, to think about that, extrapolate that one step further and connect it to what we were doing last week and also put a nice little uh, end on this uh, discussion. Um, then we can think about the Imago Dei, right? And so as I said um, last week, taking this from Kusa, um, how, would we, how could we have an image of God, right? If God is infinite, then what would it mean? What, how might it be possible to have an image of an infinite God? And Kusa points out the only way to have an image of an infinite God would be to have an infinite number of images, right? Each unique in its own way. And so therefore each image of God represents a unique aspect of infinite possibility, right? And kind of going back to what Lindsay was saying before, it, it, we then 
have some sort of responsibility to ensure that each in image of God in its possibility has the potential, has the environment, has the, the conditions in which to flourish and become exactly its unique, irreducibly particular self, right? And that only in that way can God become image through this infinite number of images. Um, and so he sees Jesus as being the um, ideal, perfect representation of the infinite spirit incarnate in the flesh and the meat, right? Because going back to Irene's reference of Irenaeus, see, yeah, I'm just tying all this shit together. It's like I plan this out. Um, that, uh, you know, allowing each one to become itself in its most authentic form of being would be to allow, not just to allow oneself to actualize one's potentiality um, as fully and uniquely as possible, but that um, is always going to be within a context, right? Within um, in a community, within an ecosystem, within um, within a series of relations with others. And I'm not going to talk about De Pace Fide because uh, I'm out of time, but that's a text that he wrote about the translation the East of faiths. And he sees um, the diversity of religions as being somewhat akin to that, that's, um, that likewise we have, um, we learn more from the diversity of religion. My, um, my cameraman, tech streamer um, guy wants to, wants me to pit, uh, mention again that we have, we're, we, we do have merch, but we're not, we're not really selling merch at this book. But yeah, the cup, we have a cup. We will be selling merch at some point, but um, I don't know. He, he wants me to show the cup. So the, the potentiality of the, the cup. And so it's the cup, right? The cup that's it's this cup, but upside down. So see, it's like a cup. This is all Cyrus's idea. It's brilliant. I love it. So the, the cup, right? Which is a cup, but not a cup, right? Because it's not a cup when it's disoriented. But here, here of the cup, disoriented in a cup that's right side up. So is it a cup or not a cup, right? Because it's a cup that's not a cup on a cup that is a cup. My boy. All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for yeah, enduring this and for sticking with it. So next week, um, I have it over here um, for the, like the, so today, Kusa. Next Thursday, we'll do a little bit more Kusa. We'll talk about the um, Divisione Day but then mostly talk about Sri Aurobindo, who's a 20th century um, Hindu philosopher, um, who's a great thinker about evolution and thinking um, about a lot of the ideas that I mentioned today. So they'll build on some of this. And then the last two, um, the last two lectures, we've got three more after this one. Um, the last two, we're going to dig into Shankara and um, Shankara's commentary on the Kata Upanishad. So we'll dig into um, that Hindu scripture and get some real concrete um, engagement with the text um, and uh, end up that way. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> um, I Thank you. you. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to keep, I'm happy to keep going. This is the end, but I'm happy to keep going and, and, uh, and entertain any questions. I'm, I'm not in any rush. So what was the name of the person, Irene, who you mentioned with the um, expanding and if you mold yourself before death, then you might as well already be dead. Who is that? Because that sounds so cool. It was so exciting to hear you talk yeah. about that. That's Irenaeus. I literally love him.